Okay, without further ado, we'll turn it over to John on the ground. Take it away. Um, thank you, Andrew. Um, first, let me begin with, uh, you know, extending my uh, condolences to both uh, all the Turks and Syrians, and obviously all other who have been impacted uh, by this catastrophic event. Um, I think on both sides of the border, the, the damage is uh, great, the pain is uh, too much, and, you know, two nations are trying to reconcile, although too early, from this catastrophic event. Um, <clears throat> let me begin with what I observed on the uh, region. Uh, I came back on Monday and I was in, in Hatay, in Antioch, uh, for two days. And the way I want to put it is, and I'm sure Omani will have more to contribute on this, until you've seen Antioch, until you've seen Hatay, it's very difficult to grasp the, to the, the extent of the destruction and the humanitarian crisis uh, that's out there. I was, uh, I almost felt like I was in a Mad Max uh, movie uh, in this, this dystopian, dystopian uh, reality where uh, everything seemed out of our world. So the damage is really great and the damage is far beyond, uh, you know, what we are seeing uh, on TV. And for millions of people, uh, as I was leaving Hatay, um, you know, uh, machines were actually now starting to clear the rubbish. So almost all hope was for, for further survivors were diminished. So now the time begins for the struggle of the survivors. And that's a long journey. That's an expensive journey. That's a tough journey. And you know, uh, the worst of this, while it may seem as if over, it's not. So you know, let me leave you with this at, from my observations from the ground. The situation, the, the depth of the pain, and the crisis is far bigger than what we, we observe on TV. Now, I want to comment on uh, two things. Obviously, being a pollster and an economist, I do have to uh, respond to the political fallout uh, of, this, of, this, uh, of this crisis. Now, it's obvious that the government has failed to provide the adequate response in the first 48 hours. <coughs> now, Let's, let's differentiate two things, right, Andrew? First of all, the scope, the, the, the geographic scope and the magnitude of this disaster is too big for any government to handle adequately. However, obviously there are degrees to uh, which uh, you can fail and not. And in the first 48 hours, I'm sorry to say that uh, the response of the Turkish state has been uh, much less than impressive. You know, the government, uh, the, the army was uh, late to be deployed the emergency teams, the coordination just wasn't there. Now it looks like things are, are picking up again, but the discussion, the coordination seems still to be lacking uh, out uh, on the field. And there's still uh, some regions that, you know, no uh, response has, has, has reached yet. So from this perspective, there's great anger uh, on the ground vis-a-vis uh, -vis the response uh, of the state, of the, of the government. Um, now, Obviously, this leads to this brings us to the political side uh, of the issue because on the short term, there's a huge uh, negative feedback uh, to the government, which obviously will have an impact on the on the Turkish uh, political scene. But you know, if you if I can leave you with anything from what I from my intervention in this panel is that know that any assessment that was made ten days ago is now irrelevant. We are in a new landscape. We are in a new uh, paradigm, so to speak. So variables of the 10, 10 days ago are now irrelevant. So, you know, do not try to assess Turkey. And I'm sure, you know, Amani will have uh, something to say on the Syrian side, on the other side of the border. But as, for, as far as Turkey is concerned, do not make any assessment based on the variables uh, of, of 10 days ago. Those are now uh, irrelevant. We are facing a new reality. We are facing a new paradigm. The entire landscape has shifted. Now, there are two perspectives of this. One is short term. As I've tried to explain on the, on, the, on the short term, there's anger towards the government. There still has to be, there still needs to be done a lot of, uh, you know, first response uh, to the survivors uh, of the earthquake. Now, President Erdogan has vowed to bring things back to normal in a year. 
uh, which brings us to the longer perspective of this. So the government is now trying to build this narrative whereby, you know, this was a uh, catastrophe for, for the century and, you know, nobody can respond to this adequately. So give us a year and, you know, we will uh, make things uh, go back to normal. But obviously between the, the, the short-term perspective and the long-term perspective really depend on when the elections are going to be held. Now, I feel that, you know, this is uh, not in good taste to discuss the date of elections in the face of such a uh, humanitarian crisis, but this is where we are. And this is one of the salient topics that's on the public agenda right now. And obviously within the scope of this panel, I do have to comment on it. Now, the government after Mr. Uh, Erdogan's uh, announcement has been using proxies to argue for the postponement of, of the elections. However, any postponement of the election right now is unconstitutional. So any method, unless if the entire uh, parliament comes together to, uh, to deliver, deliver a constitutional change to allow for the delay uh, of the uh, postponement of the elections, which are to be held in June. But anything short of that is unconstitutional. And this really defines the debate over the time of the election defines what the, the, the outcome of the, of the short-term and the long-term perspective that I tried to describe. On the short-term, there's anger, there's inadequate response, and there's grief. On the long-term, there's reconstruction, there's reconciliation, and a relatively more comfortable space uh, for the government. And which way we will go, which way Turkey will go, depends on when the elections will be held. But for me, uh, I'm an economist and a pollster, so I, you know, I can only comment on the, uh, the legal framework, er, discuss, the legal discussion around the time of the elections in an intelligible way from you know, what I've been reading uh, from, uh, from legal uh, people, from lawyers and whatnot. As far as I can see, the postponement of the elections without the uh, without the constitutional change is not possible in Turkey. So we face, in fact, another danger. If indeed uh, Turkish politics opts the way of postponing the elections with the decisions of the High Election Council, then Turkey into, enters into a uh, era of unconstitutional governance. This is clear as day and night for me. So the discussion we have right now, apart from the humanitarian side of things, is whether if Turkey will go down this unconstitutional road of postponing the election based on High Election Council's decision, which is speculated to come uh, in a couple of weeks, speculated, I repeat, or indeed, if indeed, if Turkey will remain within the boundaries of the constitutional rule and have elections in June. So this is the discussion uh, that we are uh, having right now. And the outcome of this discussion will decide which of the two scenarios, the short-term or the long-term scenario that I've described uh, in the beginning will, will play out. Um, I don't want to you know, or, you know, overextend my time. Let me stop here, uh, Andrew, and maybe I might uh, revisit some of the topics that I've talked about in the Q&A. Absolutely. And, and sorry, uh, Jean, I misintroduced you as a um, as a political scientist and you're an economist. So my bad. I'm very sorry. Uh, but as someone who no studied political science, I, I, uh, I, I appreciate your analysis uh, um, completely. Um, Amani, maybe maybe since, since you said that, let me ask just one point, uh, mm -hmm. one sentence here with my economist hat. If the long term scenario is indeed realized and, you know, uh, the elections are postponed, even though it's an it would be unconstitutional, then you know, let me very easily say that Turkey does have the fiscal space for reconstruction. So any discussion over Turkey's financial capacity to re for reconstruction is rather irrelevant because Turkey does have the fiscal space to undertake this effort. So let me stop here. Okay, thank you, John. Amani, it's it's your it's your your turn. Hi, Andrew. Thank you, John. 
Um, yeah, let me just center the conversation as well. Um, condolences to those who have lost their lives and deep, deep appreciation for search and rescue teams, both in Turkey and in Syria right now. We currently still have staff unaccounted for um, in Antakya and Gaziantep, actually in Antakya, Hatay, um, as, as John mentioned right now. So we, we can't have this conversation without centering it on the people that have survived um, and, and those have, that have lost their lives. Um, I, I want to focus on a few things, um, certainly because I am a humanitarian and a public health practitioner, but maybe situating the conversation um, in our response um, related to Syria, certainly um, working very closely in Turkey. We've been based there for over 11, 12 years now, um, based in Gaziantep, actually sort of the epicenter of the humanitarian response hub um, for us. Um, this has been an incredibly difficult time because right now, like many other organizations that have been frontline first responders, we're first trying to stabilize our own teams, make sure people are accounted for so that they can quickly mobilize and start re responding to these unprecedented humanitarian re needs, both in Turkey and in Syria right now. And I think for the, for the sort of conversation today, John touched on this, there's incredible outrage and anger and feelings of abandonment by the international community um, and otherwise um, extreme negligence in terms of why this happened. Um, and then just certainly, you know, failures um, that, that, that must be corrected at a certain point. But right now we need to find a way to sort of balance that outrage and also articulate what is needed right now for, for those because every single you know minute, hour, day that we've wasted now, almost 10 days after the earthquake, it's only meant more lives lost. Um, it only means more people waiting for loved ones that will have likely not made it out alive. So our priority right now is stabilizing our teams and also understanding what kind of support. John said this, Assessments that were done five or 10 days ago, you can just throw them right out. This is, we've barely reached the tip of the iceberg to understand what the catastrophic needs are. My perspective, I would like to offer a bit on Northwest Syria, simply because that's where we've operated for many, many years. This has not been sort of an individual effort. We've collaborated with UN agencies, um, with the Turkish um, Afad, sort of, you know, the disaster management arm, if you will. Um, this has not been an individual effort, but we have to recognize that this has been a highly localized response in Northwest Syria. Local organizations are the ones that have been on the ground, that have been at the forefront. And for five days, when there was zero international intervention or support for Northwest Syria, first responders were inside forced to search and rescue by organizations such as the White Helmets when there was zero deployments of international organizations coming in to support those efforts. A big part of that was possible because of the incredible capacity that's been built after the many years. But after this catastrophe, we have to recognize we need to build up and support local responders in moments of disaster like this. What is going on in Northwest Syria right now and certainly in Southeast Turkey is unprecedented unprecedented. There was already an existing conflict before. There was COVID, there was cholera, um, there were mass aerial attacks to civilian infrastructure by parties to the conflict, hospitals, uh, civ uh, schools, marketplaces, mass displacements in the millions in this pocket that may look sort of geographically like a small area, but it houses almost 5 million people over four and a half that are, were desperately in need of humanitarian assistance before because of all all of the factors that I've mentioned, along with the crushing economic deterioration in the entire region. Where we need to focus our conversations for those who are policymakers and those who have influence on USG and UN Security Council and whatnot. Certainly, I'm one of I'm an individual that's briefed the UN Security Council twice and have close contacts with with the council and others that are right now at the lead of decision making. Is understanding downstream right now every single decision that is taken ten days has meant more lives lost, unfortunately, and that again that's a failure. So a few things, you know, for me, I look at two to three different priorities right. Now, localization. I know oftentimes um, people in the humanitarian space, this is a feel good term. This is yes, let's support local actors. We need to put our money where our mouth is. Support local actors that are, are the front line of the response. Local can mean a variety of things, but what I mean is local organizations, whether they be diaspora or national or operating on the ground in Syria, they have that presence. This response has always been localized. International agencies, with the exception of few that have a presence in Northwest Syria, it is led by Syrian organizations. 
the U.S. government has the ability to support more Syrian American diaspora organizations, local organizations, rather than having things trickle down continuously through some of the bureaucracies of how the aid sector works right now. Um, for us, something that's really important, as I mentioned, is stabilizing our humanitarian teams right now. Our staff were displaced in every single direction. And as I said, we've already lost some, unfortunately, and may they rest in peace, and others are still accounted for. Duty of care is a tremendous area that needs to be invested in duty of care the protection of aid workers right now who are, are now still tasked with responding need to be protected we need to understand how we can stabilize them themselves their families their loved ones amidst this loss the pain the grief the suffering so that is absolutely essential um you know we we've been sort of a key interlocutor from day one and that's something we've constantly tried to advocate for is duty of care because we've often worked with it from you know sort of one off instances what happens when you have an attack to a hospital what happens when you know 10,000 people are displaced how do we relocate staff how do we make sure they're safe so that we can take care of them so that they can start taking care of others. Right now, there is displacement in mass. You have the entire humanitarian community in disarray and hysterical, and we need to be able to stabilize that operation as soon as possible. Only yesterday was a, um, a level three or sort of scale up activation um, uh, declared by the by the UN and the interagency standing committee. Now, what that means is sort of um, sort of permission to to deploy a, a large international response for coordination um, for being able to to address this crisis. There are only four other countries like that right now. There's Ukraine, there's Somalia, um, there's Ethiopia and there's Afghanistan and Syria and Turkey were only added to that yesterday where we've wasted already um, um, 10 days. And then lastly, the point I really want to emphasize, this has been an extremely politicized conflict for those of have worked in Syria for years now recognize the complexities um, of the addition of conflict um, plus crisis um, plus deep, deep, tremendous vulnerability for almost every, you know, every every um, cross section of society is maintaining humanitarian access. Logistics are not an excuse um, for withholding um, uh, desperately needed humanitarian aid. We need to maintain that access to populations. As I've uh, yesterday is, is when, you know, additional crossing points, every single crossing point needs to be activated. Coming up to the next Security Council resolution, there needs to be a permanent and indefinite opening of cross border points because every single time we restrict because of other issues of convenience, it means more lives that are not able to access um, uh, humani humanitarian aid. And then simply just, you know, this, this sustainable approach right now, as I said earlier, we're barely at the tip of the ice we have not even begun to fathom the humanitarian needs across Turkey and Northwest Syria and other parts of Syria, certainly. Um, so we need to move beyond the politicization um, and, and mobilize this response um, so that we can give people a semblance of hope. And so those who have already endured enough um, are able to have um, sort of some semblance of dignity. Um, you know, that might have not been the case for those that are still underneath the rubble and have not at a minimum been given a dignified burial at this point, since so many are still um, um, buried underneath. Um, but that's that's at, at a, at, um, what we can do at this point right now. Um, I certainly want to stop there, but I will just stop, uh, you know, st end with one last point. The U.S. government has more resources than any other country in the world. It has the ability to deploy a massive, massive um, a uh, group of individuals that are able to um, immediately respond um, and 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 save lives, and that's just what I want to want to leave you with. Um, and 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 thank you for having me. Over, Andrew. Thank you so much, Amani, and and that and that highlights, I think, an important point. The United States, uh, even now before the quake, um, uh, was supplying about uh, one billion dollars, uh, nearly, uh, in humanitarian aid to Syria per year, um, and uh, and certainly does have the resources and. And um, that's a that, that's a big reason why we're having this policy forum today to to, to sort of poke into that. So thank you so much for those comments, uh, Soner Bay. All right, let me jump in next. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, learned a lot in this panel already. Uh, uh, I, and I was thinking maybe uh, you was a Freudian slip for you to describe John as a political scientist because he does such good political analysis. I'm a big fan of his uh, Turkey report. Turkey report. Uh, learned a lot from it as well as from Amani and her presentation and uh, on the ground observations. Obviously what I'll provide cannot even come close. Um, 
to the observations provided with my colleagues, uh, but I want to do kind of a big picture view of what this means for Turkey. But before that, I want to share my condolences with everyone who have lost their lives and suffered from the earthquake. This is the most, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a horrific natural disaster, but also the the the, the most uh, uh, the significant the most significant uh, natural disaster in terms of human toll to hit Turkey. Uh, already, a uh, death toll is nearing uh, maybe forty thousand. Uh, that means it's the biggest disaster in history, and it looks like it might even climb up. So, extremely sad and uh, heartbreaking pictures and images. And I think recovery indeed will take a long time. Uh, John mentioned uh, re first reactions that the government's response was slow and cumbersome. I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, John, but I think that really describes the image of President Erdogan that emerged after the earthquake. Uh, his first response addressed to the public uh, on a buzz video. Uh, I wonder if the camera was angled intentionally uh, facing at Erdogan's nostrils uh, flaring out to make him look angry. Uh, he did look angry. Uh, he uh, chided citizens uh, for spreading fake news about the earthquake relief efforts uh, instead of embracing the citizens after this uh, horrific disaster. So number one, I think this is uh, had a lot to do, as, as John said, it's a uh, throw away most things you know about Turkish politics, if not everything, uh, in terms of recent dynamics, that is, because the earthquake will reset everything we know about Turkey. It is um, a, a disaster of biblical proportions, um, and the death toll has not really sunken yet. We don't have a precise account of how many people might be buried under the rubble. Uh, we'll uh, find out about that in the next uh, days and weeks. And of course, then you'll have a, a, a serious discussion of a responsibility, whether aid was uh, brought in in a coordinated, efficient manner. Uh, and I, I'm afraid that some uh, people who were wounded and, and trapped under the rubble uh, might have frozen to death. Uh, quite a few people, perhaps, because of hypothermia. There's going to be discussion on that because, uh, you know, in this case, uh, for such a disaster, if you're not there 28, 48, 24, 48 hours, uh, the chance for survival for many people goes down significantly. Anatolia was suffering from a historic snowstorm that didn't help and of course the destruction is really massive we have never seen anything like this so perhaps no government could have handled destruction of this scope but even then uh the aid was i think uh relief aid that is coming in was uh, slow and uncoordinated and still is perhaps there are still towns and communities that have not been reached out in contrast uh, civil society in turkey has done really well uh, perhaps, uh, you know, leading uh, state-led uh, efforts and in some cases surpassing them. So that shows to us the depth of Turkey's middle class and NGOs, and it's a really good sign for the country's future and about its resilience. But for President Erdogan, I think uh, this is perhaps really troublesome because Erdogan has built in the last 20 years an image for himself as an autocratic but efficient, effective, and caring leader. So the second part of that brand is now challenged. You know, Erdogan still looks powerful. His address to the nation made him look angry as well, but the caring, efficient, effective part is not there. And I think the more there's a discussion on responsibility, whether aid came in fast, if there was corruption in terms of construction, you know, uh, there are pictures where you see entire neighborhoods destroyed. So that was a powerful earthquake. And sadly, there are pictures where you see an apartment block standing next to an apartment block that has pancaked. That's not the strength of the earthquake. That's the structural integrity of the building. And that's where you know you have issues of code and urban zoning violations and construction violations and uh, probably corruption allegations. So all that I think will bring President Erdogan under a powerful scrutiny. He'll try to push back. I think what he'll do is he'll double down on the fear factor. If he's not, if it doesn't look efficient and caring and uh, then he's going to look, try to look strong and more autocratic. So that's why I think it's intentional, perhaps, that Erdogan's first messaging to the public was not that he recognized their suffering, but that he was uh, making a list of people that he was going to go after for spreading uh, fake news. So it's not necessarily good news for his brand. And I want to note that Erdogan built this image over 20 years, uh, following uh, actually in the aftermath, starting with a process when his party AKP came to power, Justice and Development Party in 2002. And that process followed another big earthquake in Turkey in 1999. That earthquake, in my view, uh, de destroyed the ideological hold of the Turkey's Kemalist state, uh, a state that was autocratic, uh, yet also said it was efficient, 
and will be there to take care of citizens. And just as that state collapsed like a house of cards in the aftermath of the 1999 earthquake, because it did not deliver aid efficiently and on time, uh, Erdogan's image now faces a big uh, problem and challenge. So it is going to double down, of course, I think on the autocratic side, unfortunately, but also, as John said, maybe try to postpone elections. That will be a violation of the constitution. The constitution in Turkey does not allow elections to be delayed beyond June 18th. There's only one uh, clause under which elections can be delayed. And in that case, for one year and through a parliamentary vote, that is if there is war uh, between Turkey and another country. That's now not a possibility at all. You know, before the earthquake, again, throwing everything we know about, most things we know about Turkish politics in recent days out. Before the earthquake, some people suggested that escalation of tension between Turkey and Greece could result in conflict. Uh, there's zero chance now. Uh, all of Turkey's neighbors have flown in assistance. Uh, Greeks have brought in tons. Uh, Armenia, with which Turkey has no ties. And that has, of course, improved the views of both countries. And Greeks have also done terrific public diplomacy that goes with it. So I would say uh, there's no way elections can be postponed right now as a result of uh, that kind of a um, uh, scenario. Even ties with Assad regime, I think, will probably benefit. Turkey's uh, reset attempts with Assad will benefit from this because there is now, for the first time, as Amani was uh, referring to it, perhaps cross-border cooperation. Turkish trucks take aid to cross border crossing. Assad regime picks them up from these crossings, so they're in touch. Uh, that's not happened in recent memory. And finally, on the foreign policy side, before I add up, uh, finish up, I think uh, that notwithstanding President Erdogan's efforts in the last 10 years to remake Turkey's identity internationally as a more Middle Eastern or Muslim nation, and these efforts have not been completely successful, but notwithstanding Erdogan's efforts to change Turkey's identity, Turkey's citizens have concluded in the last week, 10 days, that Turkey's best friends are still Europeans and NATO allies. That's where aid came from, you know, from the Spanish to the Swedes, from the United States, which has done significant blood bringing aid to uh, the Greeks, uh, all NATO and EU members, and as well as the Israelis, I think have also benefited uh, from a great public diplomacy campaign that have uh, brought in the second largest team after Azerbaijanis and also done well receiving accolades. So I think one of the conclusions that Turkey citizens will take away from this is uh, despite the framing of the West as the enemy, as the other, uh, perhaps Europe and NATO members and, and some countries in the West are not so much the other in Turkey. So that's a, perhaps one positive takeaway, if, if there could be, from this uh, horrible and historic disaster that has caused so many um, uh, so much suffering for so many people. And in final uh, finishing, I think this is a really big test for President Erdogan. Uh, his image as the autocratic fatherly figure that takes care of you uh, has been seriously undermined, and it'll be hard for him to reset that image, especially once there is a discussion on uh, corruption prior to the earthquake uh, that could be uh, that could have resulted in some of the death toll, as well as post-earthquake relief efforts and the nature and slow coming nature of these efforts. All that will put him under pressure. I think uh, what Erdogan will do if he cannot postpone elections, uh, because uh, opposition has doubled down and said that would be a violation of the constitution is that he might perhaps go into elections as late as possible, that would be June 18th, but using state of emergency. Uh, the government has already declared a state of emergency in 10 provinces impacted by the earthquake. I think that's justifiable, but I'm not gonna ask uh, jurists to weigh in. Uh, you have uh, cases of looting as well as uh, efficiency to deliver aid. Uh, that state of emergency expires in May. Uh, government will probably extend this through the election period. So. In 10 provinces constituting 15% of Turkey's population, elections won't be free uh, because rights and liberties will have been will be suspended. Uh, and maybe President Erdogan will extend state of emergency entirely across, across the entire country. We'll still see that. I would uh, finish by saying that Turkish politics is entering terra incognita. We have never seen anything like this because we have never seen a country face this kind of destruction. The area impacted by the twin earthquakes, both deadly, both record on the Richter scale for this part of the country, uh, and in fact, almost for all of Turkey. Uh, the area is the size of the US state of Ohio, almost the size of Germany. Uh, you just imagine the sheer scope of it. The death toll, uh, maybe what we're seeing is not the entire number. The numbers will be are climbing fast. And I think only once we have a, a true account of what actually happened, and the, and the suffering that was inflicted on the citizens, you're going to have a complete reset of Turkish politics. So it is terra incognita. That's where I want to end up with. And over to you, Andrew. Thank you. 
thank you, Soner, uh, for that uh, that summary. Um, and uh, I think it's. I, I'm just going to say a few things to to wrap up the the comments here from a policy perspective, and then we'll go into question and answer. So, um, for all of you out there uh, who are vi viewing via Zoom, please put your questions in the Q and A function at the bottom. And for those of you joining via YouTube, you can write to Policy Forum at Washington Institute. Org. So I think many of you who follow this um, closely or politically uh, noted um, UN Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Martin Griffith's um, recent uh, presentation to the UN Security Council, uh, which uh, followed a, a closed session uh, of the council. And following that, um, the UN's, uh, the Syrian regime's representative of the UN, Bassam Sabah, uh, announced that the Assad, the Assad regime had agreed to a three-month opening of two additional crossings for UN aid at uh, Bab al Salama and Rai uh, into northwest Syria, uh, and also from inside of Syria. And that's, of course, a reference to cross-line aid um, from regime to rebel-held areas. And that announcement led to widespread praise from Russia and China in particular, and a number of regional and Western countries alike. And while any aid is good aid in such a situation, and it's good news for those that are suffering from the earthquake's devastation. And I think Amani really highlighted that uh, um, very well. Sabag's gesture of a mere three months of UN aid through border crossings into areas of Syria that the regime has not controlled for over a decade is an empty gesture in response to the escalating needs of those suffering from the quake in Syria, which has claimed over 4,000 lives in rebel held areas alone. This is especially so given the regime's track record of diverting and weaponizing aid provided through Damascus. And there are people far better at this than I am who have accounted for this based on data from inside of Syria and around Syria. And the reason why this is a particularly salient political policy point is that the US, UK, EU, and Canada, our closest allies, provide 91%, $2.16 billion of the overall aid that is, set, that is sent to Syria every year. And already the lion's share of aid that is provided to Syria in a humanitarian sense is provided through Damascus. So with that in mind, I have a few observations and we'll, we'll, we'll go to question and answer. I think the United States needs to act immediately to alleviate the widespread human suffering in Syria. And I think they're already acting to do so. But first and foremost, the United States should seek a UN Security Council resolution ensuring that additional and all crossings for UN aid into Syria are extended for at least one year and beyond. For the past several years, cross-border aid into Northwest Syria has become a political football at the UN Security Council, with Russia in 2020 reducing the number of crossings to one at Bab al-Hawa, and in 2022, from a duration of one year renewal to every six months. This has hobbled the response to earthquake relief to date and shows the li liabilities of narrowing options into Northwest Syria. And I hope it's a lesson learned, um, but we'll see what happens. The second and far more complicated effort, I think that the United States needs to do regards appropriately relaxing US sanctions on Syria to support legitimate earthquake relief for Syrian civilians while not fueling the regime's active campaign to lift sanctions placed upon it for its conduct during the war, including mass atrocities, chemical weapons use, and more recently even, narcotics production and trafficking. And this, of course, this effort to normalize with them is, is dovetailing with their overall effort in the region uh, to, to normalize relations with between Damascus and a number of Gulf countries, but not only. So to date, the United States uh, last week on February 8th issued general license number 23, um, which is uh, authorizes transactions related to re earthquake relief efforts in Syria. That general license, which is the third of its kind under the Biden administration, uh, is aimed to ensuring that sanctions do not impede humanitarian activities in support of the Syrian people. Um, of course, uh, humanitarian activities are not covered by the uh, by U.S. sanctions or not affected in theory. But this particular general license is uh, noteworthy, I think, in two respects. One is it, it specifically addresses the largest physical destruction in Syria, not due to the ongoing war in that country, and um, that was waged by Bashar al-Assad against the Syrian people. 
And two, and most probably controversially on Capitol Hill, it allows transactions with the government of Syria, whose ministries and agencies and military and security forces are wholly controlled by the Assad regime. So the issue I think about General, General License 23, while it's good to reduce risk to those that wanna provide for aid that's going into Syria, the problem is that compared with the other licenses under the Biden administration, this one is far, far less explicit and as, um, as what's referred to as a blanket license. It authorizes all transactions related to earthquake relief in Syria, including controversially persons who meet the definition of the term government of Syria. But perhaps more controversially, the license goes on to say the U.S. financial institutions and U.S. registered money transmitters may rely on the originator for the funds transfers with regard to compliance, i.e. they're allowed to take at face value um, the reason for the money being sent into Syria without challenging that. And of course, um, this is um, this is very difficult, I think, for for to for that aid to legitimately reach those on on the ground in Syria and those kind of earthquake relief activities um, while still trying to keep the 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 original intent of U.S. sanctions. Um, I think that in order to properly execute this license, and we can go into a little bit of the details on the license if you like in the Q&A, the administration should immediately order, um, this would be the White House, I would think in particular, an intelligence assessment based on imagery resources to determine what structures in Syria have been destroyed or damaged due to the earthquake versus those by over a decade of war within the country and particularly the Assad regime's barrel bombings in places like Eastern Aleppo, uh, but not only restricted to there. This will help give the administration a good baseline for where the earthquake relief is being spent over the next six months. The license uh, is a, um, a blanket exemption for six months. And to what degree it's being diverted to regime reconstruction activities, um, which it can, and the regime continues to insist that, that, the, that the international community um, uh, pay for the reconstruction of Syria. And I think uh, uh, number four, um, instead of getting continually flat-footed, by events coming out of Syria and backed into corners by Moscow that reduce US and allied options. Washington needs to focus more on developments coming in and out of Syria and in doing so, think creatively if it seeks to achieve the policy objectives in Syria in pursuit of the support for the Syrian people and against those of the Assad regime and its Iranian and, and Russian supporters. One such idea is the creation of a white channel for humanitarian and other, inc other incident specific aid into Syria similar to the approach taken with Iran in October 2020, when Washington announced that foreign governments and financial institutions could establish a payment mechanism for legitimate humanitarian exports to that country, as long as no funds were transferred through the regime. Creating such a channel for Syria would require simultaneous decisions by like-minded governments to allow the mechanism, as well as the establishment of a sovereign clearinghouse to address transition risk, transaction risk for shipments into Syria. This would help ensure that the Assad regime and designated organizations do not benefit from or manipulate the aid as created by the opening in general license number 23. Okay, um, so without further ado, we can move to just a second. We can move to the question and answer period. Thank you everybody for, for, uh, for attending today. Um, the first question um, I have uh, is concerns the uh, comments, I believe, by Jean and also uh, Sonair, um, asking uh, concerning the um, response, which is labeled inadequate uh, from the Turkish side, what more could have been done? What could the government have done better given the circumstances, the extraordinary circumstances that Sonair uh, outlined that were in front of them? Whoever would like to answer that. John, do you want to jump in because you're on the field and uh, witnessed it? And I'm happy to uh, compliment whatever you say or add to it. Sure, sure, Sonia. So there are two sides to this, Andrew. First, um, the initial response, the first 30, 48 hours was inadequate. The army should have been deployed, which is obviously has the greatest capacity to, to, to respond. Uh, to, to such crises. I mean, the chain, you know, the command uh, is obviously much more suitable to, to respond to this and experienced. Uh, second, what we've seen is that AFAD, the disaster management sort of uh, organization institution, 
uh, was uh, inadequate uh, in its its response in in coordination, which should not be surprising because it, it very recent internal audits of Afat, uh, which whereby you know their internal bureaucrats uh, audits evaluate their response to recent uh, other earthquakes in Turkey has actually pointed out within the institution all the shortcomings of the institution in this earthquake. So they have been warned. They knew about this. And nonetheless, they failed to, uh, they failed to make up uh, for the uh, points that were produced in those reports. This is number one. So this is, I'm talking about, about the immediate aftermath uh, of, the, of the crisis. But another problem we are seeing, what we are seeing is that what we realized after this uh, earthquake is that enforcement of the construction code has been completely missed in the past decades through you know poor enforcement of the law because obviously after 19 after the 1999 marmara uh, earthquake which was a devastating earthquake for turkey as well <coughs> although pales in comparison or oh, pales in uh, in 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 strength and scope in comparison to what we experienced in southeastern Turkey uh, 10 days ago, a week ago. However, we had a very, Turkey had a very strong, a solid, waterproof, so to speak, uh, construction code, which we now realize has not been enforced. So this is, you know, this is about uh, also the, the, you know, what could have been done was, was the enforcement of that construction code so that, you know, some of these buildings at least could withstand. The, the 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 earthquake and a a very recent simulation by the Afat actually predicts a seven point health points uh, earthquake in the region and outlines what needs to be done in that scenario and we realized immediately after the earthquake that you know those report, reports went uh, unnoticed so this is what could have been done uh, by the government. Again, let me, you know, I'm not here, uh, you know, let's be reasonable. This is a huge earthquake. The geography, the scope is huge, but this is not a surprise. This was expected. This was documented and this was studied. And, uh, you know, through uh, construction license amnesties, which allowed for, uh, you know, uh, sub, uh, suboptimal or, you know, subpar, construction to be built and then license to be given, the reports that weren't followed, the reports that weren't taken seriously, all, all brought, up, brought us to this inadequate, immediate, uh, after response uh, to the earthquake. The death toll could have been much, much less. You know, the announcement right now is that, I think the recent uh, official announcement was somewhere around 33,000. That will go way above that, Andrew. I mean. The number of buildings that have been destroyed. I, this is simple math, uh, maths, right? I'm not, I'm not making it up. So this could have been prevented. And this is what I mean by inadequate response. Two things. First, uh, very poor uh, enforcement of the construction code. Uh, construction license amnesties that has been uh, granted over the past decades. Uh, and finally, uh, the, the, the disaster management team not taking seriously their internal reports that have clearly predicted this earthquake and also outlined the fact that the institution was not ready to respond to this earthquake. All this was neglected. So had, the, had this not been the case, there would have been much better. Uh, response uh, to this uh, catastrophic event. Yeah, just very quickly, just to add to what John said, uh, more could have been done before, obviously, uh, given that Turkey has suffered from earthquakes and, uh, and uh, you know, tighter uh, regulations were passed following the 1999 earthquake that were not observed. As I said, not all destruction can be explained through force majeure. If a building, uh, entire apartment block is standing next to one that has pancaked, that's not force majeure. That is uh, structural integrity. And then post earthquake, uh, again, John's comments on uh, military deployment. So Turkey has no national guard uh, as the U.S. does. 
but it has what's called gendarme, which is uh, you know public safety. And uh, in past earthquakes, the gendarme would have been mobilized. This time it was not, at least not the first 48 hours. And then when it was in small numbers, that would have probably made a big impact in pulling people out of the rubble, injured uh, and wounded perhaps, but alive and not uh, freezing to death, uh, which is, I think will probably explain in hindsight a large number of the very sad uh, casualties. And then, of course, the third point is uh, response institutions, relief response institutions. I think one of the legacies of President Erdogan in Turkey is that he's gutting out institutions where they're no more staffed by people who are capable, but they're staffed by people who are loyal to the president. And so uh, Red Crescent, Kızılay in Turkey, uh, is nowhere. Uh, it used to be Turkey's prime relief agency. It's been completely gutted out. Turkey's uh, AFA, the Turkish equivalent of FEMA, again, um, you know, I, I saw uh, they're tweeting saying, oh, we have delivered 3,000 tents uh, to a city where uh, 3,000 buildings have collapsed, uh, each with 20 units uh, in them. Um, so they're only, uh, you know, cause I think, uh, scratching the surface in terms of bringing in assistance. Yes, this was a huge disaster, but relief agencies that have been gutted out were ineffective. And what happened was civil society uh, led relief efforts, still does in my view. Uh, you know, uh, there's a Turkish rock star who uh, has probably done more to save lives than some of these relief agencies by themselves. So that in that regard, I think it really shows your resilience of Turkey as a society, the depth of its middle class and NGOs. But uh, definitely uh, there could be more coordinated efforts if the agencies themselves were staffed by capable people to respond to the earthquake. Okay. Um I have a question concerning um, the lifting or the easing of U.S. sanctions uh, for assistance to by the United States on, uh, to Syria. And um, the question is, could this help foster the strength of civil emergency response in Syria in the longer term? Amani, what do you think? Yeah, let me say just a couple of things real quick related to my colleagues um, in Turkey, just re related to just to parallel sort of the legal framework in northwest Syria that is absent. A lot of these amnesties, retrofitting, whatnot, is non-existent. And there have been active campaigns to actually destroy civilian infrastructure. So you can imagine the vulnerability um, of structures and, and people first and foremost. Um, related to this topic, I definitely don't want to derail it because I know everyone is so fixated on sanctions right now. As you mentioned, Andrew, humanitarian assistance was not impacted by sanctions. In fact, there are whole permissions to continue to, live, to deliver humanitarian assistance amidst these sanctions. Um, so we need to focus on, on what's what's important right now. Um, I think people need to understand NGOs have already been operating in both government of Syria um, and, and obviously opposition controlled areas. They are the life force of the response in, in all, of, all of the geographic areas. By lifting sanctions, you're simply perpetuating this normalization narrative that started to emerge in the last you know, few months, few years, whatever it is related to reconstruction efforts um, without addressing major human rights violations that have been perpetuated, um, perpetrated, excuse me, by the government of Syria and allies, you should not be lifting sanctions um, unless it is simply to facilitate humanitarian assistance, as I said, which was already, so, so, so oftentimes I think some people don't understand that that was already in place before. Um, and, and it's absolutely imperative that we keep the conversation focused on getting humanitarian assistance to the areas that need it. This is, you know, been sort of a hallmark of, of the crisis where we've seen aid obstruction over and over and over again um, due to geographic lines. Um, and I just, I might have, it seemed, I, I, it, it appears I might have misspoke just simply related to um, the border crossings. The delivery of aid by those will not be delivered by the government of Syria. The government of Syria certainly used that as a bargaining chip, and we know that, and I don't know where, you know, humanitarian actors will pay the price down the line, but certainly the frontline responders who are in northwest Syria and on the Turkish side will continue to respond. Those crossing points certainly are open, and, and you know, again, pushing for um, indefinite um, access is, is, is our imperative right now. Over. Okay, thank you very much, um, Amani. Um, the, uh, the next question I have, and we are, we're just about five minutes out because we have a, we only have an hour here today and time, time flies by, um, during such discussions, uh, unfortunately, but, um, so the, um, I have a question here concerning, will this earthquake, uh, you, uh, well, I, I think it's probably in reaction to Jean and Soner's talking about the assumptions of before the earthquake or now, 
completely different. Um, Amani mentioned this as well, and I think now people are trying to probe, like, where okay, what what assumptions do we now make, right? So then I think we have this question here. Um, uh, will this, um, has this earthquake affected, uh, or will it cause a reset in relations between Turkey uh, and the United States? And then there's another question that how will it affect the already ongoing attempts at reset of relations between um, President Erdogan of Turkey and President Assad of Syria? So lots of, lots of questions, any of you could, could answer it. So take it away. Should I go first, John, or? Uh... Please, Sonar, go ahead. So, so yeah, I think uh, not a reset between Turkey and US, but a reset in the Turkish mindset towards the West, you know, uh, for maybe uh, 10 years, 15 years now, anti-Western sentiments have been mainstreamed in Turkey by political elites. Uh, the West has usually been framed as the other immoral in quotes and various other negative adjectives and always uh, running conspiracies to divide and undermine Turkey. Uh, these uh, conspiracy theories have become quite mainstream. Uh, it's really hard to sell these now, you know, when uh, Israelis, uh, Swedes, Greeks, Spaniards, Americans are pulling uh, people out of the rubble when relief uh, agencies run by the government are nowhere. So Turkey citizens are realizing through this, uh, you know, test, uh, uh, a sad one that, you know, uh, perhaps uh, Turkey's old allies in the West, including U.S., but also NATO and EU member countries are uh, closer to Turkey than uh, political elites have said they are. And actually, uh, perhaps you know, that they're more interested in Turkey's welfare than uh, the case has been made for them. So that's really, I think, good news in the, in the bigger picture. Uh, I think, yeah, Turkish uh, Syrian normalization will be accelerated because now you actually have coordination of relief efforts, uh, uh, at least seems to be the case. Um, and finally, uh, you know, uh, the bigger question about what we should not assume going forward. President Erdogan domestically is uh, both loved and feared or was loved and feared. Uh, you know, he has a base that loves him and he has an opposition that fears him. I think that at this moment, it's hard to say that the base uh, looks at him with the same affection because the argument Erdogan made to the base was that he represented the people on the other side of the tracks. He was the voice of the common voter and he would take care of them. And uh, clearly two weeks almost into this disaster, that's not been the case. And the fear factor, I think the anger is so palpable that uh, I saw this in the pushback to this, let's postpone elections beyond the constitutionally prescribed June 18th deadline idea floated by an early former Erdogan ally. The pushback was so severe, people are basically not willing to put up with that. So I think one assumption is that Erdogan is loved less by his base and feared less by his opponents as a result of uh, basically the reaction to the earthquake and the debate that is building up. And I want to end, Andrew, by saying that this is really a horrific disaster. The death toll has already exceeded other natural disasters. And probably in the next few days, uh, more people will have lost in this earthquake than did in Turkey's independence war in 1920-22. That's why it is terra incognita, and you need to kind of forget everything you know about Turkey. Discussion will be who is responsible for our countries in Turkey, that is biggest disaster. And so that means, uh, you know, a love for Erdogan will be a little bit less and fear for him is going to be a little bit less going forward. Um, maybe let me take it from here. I, I agree with Sonar, what Sonar said. I'll make three points and I'll make them very quickly. First, uh, the in, the the discussion over how this will impact Turkey's relationship with uh, with the West or with Syria at this point in time for Turkey, I find quite irrelevant. Because if I may leave you with one, one thought this evening, is that watch the decision on Turkish election timing very closely. Anything short of a constitutional change, you know, any delay, without the constitutional change will effectively mean that the constitution is being withheld in Turkey, will mean that we are no longer operating in a constitutional regime. So, you know, if I can leave you with one thing, let, let it be this one. So the international relation perspective right now for Turkey, I find quite irrelevant. That's number one. Second, as Soner said, <coughs> the pouring international support uh, from, particularly the Greeks or and the Armenians, 
I, I believe that it has uh, impacted uh, the public perception uh, rather positively uh, on the back of all this, you know, negative uh, discourse has been building up for, especially since uh, for the past six, seven years. But let me also tell you that I find it despicable that, uh, you know, uh, some European leaders chose to approach the issue from a refugee uh, perspective and, you know, uh, try to frame the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the disaster uh, with regards to the impact uh, on the number of refugees that would go to EU. And this was the Belgian prime minister who did this. So this is completely opposite of what the communities of, you know, these uh, other countries have been trying to do in Turkey, you know, putting out, putting aside all the conflict, putting aside all the prejudice, coming here to help, putting their lives at risk. And at the other hand, we have EU leaders talking about the potential impact uh, of refugee inflows into the EU and that Turkey should accept more. I find this discussion despicable and rather counter uh, productive to, to, to the positive vibe that has been uh, uh, that has been uh, created. Finally, uh, let me uh, say that uh, this, I think this event, this catastrophic event has ignited a discussion of a real discussion of institutions and meritocracy in Turkey that will have repercussions on Turkish politics, not only on the short term, but in the uh, long term uh, as well. So let me uh, leave you with these three points. And thank you very much for uh, having me on this panel. Thank you, John. We're almost out of time. Um, Amani, I'm going to give you the last word. Um, you, 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 we talked a lot about it, the, the huge resources of the United States government. Um, and you talked about helping groups on the ground. What, what specifically could the U.S. do? What, 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 what practical rep recommendation would you have at this point, given that they're opening up the floodgates of aid into Syria? Yeah, I, I think just as one of the most powerful world leaders, the, the U.S. needs to set an example right now. I think as John and, and, and my very eloquent and articulate colleagues um, said right now, this is not, you know, the time to politicize um, this catastrophic event. Um, we cannot, what oftentimes people say, Rob Paul to pay Peter. The people of Turkey and the people of Syria both need support right now, not only mobilizing funding, but mobilizing it fast enough right now, because every minute lost um, means more lives, um, unfortunately. So that's all I'll leave you with. Okay, thank you so much for that. I wish we had another hour to go through this. Uh, we do have some other questions. Unfortunately, I've been unable to get to them. Uh, thank you uh, so much to our panelists uh, for, your, um, for your very frank comments. Uh, thank you for everybody who's tuned in today. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, there's going to be a lot more activity on this uh, concerning both Turkey and Syria um, from a, a variety of aspects. I think it really it's uh, I think it's not just shaken up the 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 landscape in both Turkey and, and Syria very sadly, but I think it's actually shaken up uh, policy as concerns uh, Syria in general and 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 I think with some deep implications for U.S. Syria for U.S. Uh, Turkish um, uh, relations as well. But um, but anyways, as uh, Amani said, I think today this is the tip of the iceberg. Um, and please uh, please direct any future questions to us here at the institute.